not a con. Late hour, thank you for being here. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about what I'm going to talk about and how we're going to do it. They've allotted a two-hour slot, which is a long, long time at this hour of the night. But uh, we'll do uh, maybe an hour. Uh, we'll see how the Q&A is. And it's up to you whether you want to take any particular piece or part of what I'm going to talk about and uh, explore it more deeply or ask questions about it. Uh, I, I was asked to talk about uh, creativity and the sources of creativity. Uh, I, I guess I should tell you a little bit about myself, uh, because then that will establish at least some platform for why I feel like I can talk about it a little bit. My name is Richard Thiem. I am currently in, I guess, what you would call a third career. Uh, my first career, I taught English Lit, and I wrote fiction. Uh, I did that in my 20s. In my 30s and 40s, I was an Episcopal priest. I did that in three different cultures. I don't want that to confuse anybody. We can talk seriously about what it really means, but what it really means to be an Episcopal priest in Utah among Mormons and then in Hawaii among Asians and Polynesians when you're a Haole uh, in Lahaina Beach Town, and then in Milwaukee, which is a Germanic culture very much like Cleveland's. Uh, those are three different cultures, and each one forces you to pay attention to the way people think, behave, and the unconscious cues that they use because to do ministry really means to listen attentively, closely, and deeply to people in order to know what it is exactly that they're really presenting you with. And then for the last 12 years, the third career has been I, I just talk a lot. I speak and write mostly full time. The joke is, why do I speak so much? Because I have no skills. It's really not a joke. It's the honest to God truth. Uh, but what I can do out of the literature and out of the ministry and out of listening and out of the technology piece is try to put some things together that illuminate what it is we're all trying to do with our lives, which, especially the domain of computer technology and information security, is live on an edge that is constantly shifting and have to reassemble ourselves in relationship to the recontextualization of life around us in a constant way because information security is not what it used to be. It changes. Uh, let me give you three markers as an example. Jay Heiser, does that name ring a bell? Anybody know who he is? Jay Heiser writes for Information Security Magazine. And he, he does talks. And he was on a platform with somebody who introduced himself as a white hat hacker. And uh, it irritated the hell out of him. And he wrote a big whole piece about it. That's how you know somebody's really irritated. And what he said, in effect, is this being recorded? Anybody recording? Okay, thank you. It just changes. Changes. It changes what you say. Not really. I would never say anything differently if it was recorded <laughs> uh, than what I say. But what he said is, what is all this nonsense about being cowboys? What is this white hat hacker bullshit in effect? What is this cowboy stuff? We're not cowboys. We're engineers. And what information security is about is securing complex systems. And that's the end of it. It's a science, or maybe not, but it's a technology. It's, a, it's not cowboy stuff. All right, now, you flash back 10 or 15 years. Go back to the 80s. And this is how I got into it in the first place. And I use that as a segue. Uh, I used to teach lit, as I said. And I used to write fiction. And then I did ministry. Now, what does that mean? It means I was formed by text and understood how text works. Now, by text, of course, you'd read and write. But by text, I meant this stuff, the stuff of typographic civilization. that really had not been around until 1450s when the printing press was invented. So I was very much a creature of text. And I didn't realize, like any fish in any water, how completely it formulated my sense of identity, my sense of possibilities. And in fact, at every level of the fractal, the world around me, the political, economic, and social structures all around me had come out of the post-printing press, post-Renaissance, post-Reformation, post-1400s world. And if you look back historically, that is really exactly when everything began to transform. From 500 to about 1500, it was really pretty much one kind of thing. And the kind of thing it was was founded in writing. 
Over several thousand years, writing had midwifed consciousness into the condition in which it found itself, and printing transformed that. So I pretty much knew how text works. And ministry is using text, symbolic, deep, profound text, to articulate for people their greatest possibilities. It's to call forth who they most definitely in their best moments are or can be. And then in the early 80s, I was playing A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's coming out now, isn't it? Isn't the movie out? Is it out yet? Any, any day now, right? We hope, we hope they didn't screw it up, right? <laughs> because it could be the greatest or the most disappointing and depressing thing in the world. Uh, but the book was terrific. And then the computer game. Anybody play Infocom's Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Uh, Infocom and the great, anybody, I, I should do a historical, you know, kind of reality check. How many of you know what I mean by Infocom? Oh, God, that's wonderful. Oh, God, that's never going to happen again. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, I'm not going to say what that's analogous to. That's so good. Uh, because Infocom was the medium through which some of the most creative guys like Steve Moretzky and those guys did interactive fiction. Interactive fiction is putting it on, in my case, an Apple II Plus. Great big green blocky letters, right? 64K, a little floppy, noisy drive going. And, and it created worlds, worlds of the imagination. And, and Hitchhiker's Guide and Trinity and A Mind Forever Voyaging are among the greatest literary works in, in interactive fiction. They just haven't been recognized as such. They were so evocative. And uh, I was playing one of those with my, my son. And we were, were deeply immersed in it. Uh, so much so that I was working as a priest then. And he would come to the communion rail, you know, kind of kneel, like a kid should. And uh, he would, instead of holding out his hand like this, he'd go like this. And I would say, what the hell are you doing? And he would say, I'm trying to act like the bug bladder beast of Troll, so that I will jar you into having an insight at an anomalous moment. He didn't speak like that, but that's what he was saying. Uh, as to how the hell we can get out of the lair of the beast. Uh, because we didn't know yet that you had to wrap the towel around your head because the beast was so stupid that if you couldn't see it, it thought it couldn't see you. We're playing that game, and I had an insight that changed my life. I thought, I am not only changing how I think, I am being changed fundamentally by interacting with this simple manipulating machine called a computer through interactive text. And my perception turned out to be correct. And that's why I could never really go home again. Once you have an insight, a creative insight, it changes you forever, unless you take drugs or something to wipe out that memory, which you can do. But you want to remember it because it changes you usually for the better. It recontextualizes how you think. And what I saw was that interacting with network computers was going to change civilization kind of like it was changing me. It was restructuring my very essential identity. And therefore, what was going to happen to those social and economic and political abstractions and organizations and structures around us was also going to change equally. Uh, well, this I'm still making my uh, case to say I have something to say about creativity. So I wrote a long article called Computer Applications for Spirituality, the Transformation of Religious Experience. And I sent it to the biggest theological journal we had in the Episcopal Church, Anglican Theological Review. They sent it back with notes in the, in the margins. Not just notes, nasty notes. I mean, only religious people can get nasty like this, right? Because they think they're right. And it said things like, who the hell does he think he is? And God forbid, and perish the thought, and you know, just sent it back and said, this is ridiculous. Five years later, that same journal had a new editor. I sent the same thing back to them. And this time I got a glowing letter from the new editor saying, this is so cutting edge and far seeing. We're privileged to, to print this. I laughed, of course, because anyone in computing knew it was hopelessly out of date. I mean, I used things like AI and MUDs and MOOs and MUSHES as my examples of transforming power technology. I was still talking about Apple II Commodore stuff, uh, bulletin boards. You know, it was just hopelessly out of date. But they didn't know that. And that is one of the reasons it became perfectly clear to me when I was asked if I wanted to be a bishop and those other things. As you move up in a hierarchical structure, whether it's bishop or general or whatever, your promotions are contingent on your changing nothing. In other words, each rung of the ladder up in the military or in the church or whatever has to indicate a commitment to the system that promotes you and its values so that you are saying, thank you for rewarding me and I will change nothing in the future. 
By the time you become a general or a bishop or whatever, you are lock, stock, and barrel, owned by the institutional life, and that looks like death to me. So when I was being offered those opportunities, I renounced orders and left 12 years ago and uh, panicked my wife, who had gotten used to a steady income, and we had seven kids between us, and they all intended to go to college. Well, they all did, one way or another. Uh, so things do get done. But it was because I couldn't live anymore in an environment which was going to take, well, you know, the church apologized to Galileo. The Pope made a big thing out of that. Catholic Church apologized to Galileo 400 years later. I didn't have that kind of time. You know, I was pretty clearly middle-aged, and it was now or never. So I renounced orders in order to be totally free from the internal constraints that otherwise were imprisoning me in a thought world that was inhibiting my ability to think all the way out. So I guess if there's one lesson that we want to remember from that, it's the context in which you put yourself and whether or not it will support your creativity and your very best efforts is very important because the culture or the organizational life around you can assimilate you and suck you dry. At the least, it can just change you. It can just keep you from thinking as far out as you can think by insisting on punishing you in subtle ways. It doesn't have to be to the wall with him. It just has to be little things that keep you from, from doing your very, very best or even being idiosyncratic, different, and willing to explore new opportunities. I'll give you an example. I once did some work for a bank. And this guy came to me after the workshop or whatever it was. He's wearing a conservative suit, conservative tie, white shirt. And he said, you know, I've been at this bank eight years. And when I came here eight years ago, I went to my first meeting wearing a conservative suit, a conservative tie, and a light blue shirt. And I noticed that everybody was staring at me, just staring. And as I walked back to my cubicle, I realized that I was the only one in the whole bank that was wearing a blue shirt. Everybody else had on a white shirt. He said, you know, I have never worn anything since that day but a white shirt. And you know what they call me behind my back? The guy in the blue shirt. Eight years later, the guy in the blue shirt. That is not an environment in which you are going to be encouraged to be creative. The irony was, I was later brought into that bank to talk to the credit card division because now technology was changing everything and people who for up to 30 years coming there from high school, had been taught one thing, which is just do it the way we tell you. Don't question it. Just do it the way the system requires. Suddenly we're being told we need the attributes of leaders. We want creativity. We want originality. But the environment had so sucked that out of them that it was virtually impossible for people to flip on a dime and provide it. Right? So most of the time when we talk about things like creativity, we're really not asking the right questions. A friend of mine at NSA, says, these are really the questions. And in his granular work, you know, they do incredible work at NSA. But he says, these are the questions that should be asked. How do you live vibrantly? How do you free the mind? How do you live in a world without walls? Now, this is a brand new thing, this world without walls. It has created a new kind of being. I don't know the various ages in the room, but I know when I first went to DEF CON 10 years ago, It'll be 10 years this summer that I've been speaking to DEF CON. And I began talking to the younger people in the room. Why? Because one of the places I realized I had to partner if I was going to have a clue what was going on in the world were with young people who were much exclusively, all of them, smarter than me, but often unconsciously, not aware of how incredibly much they were building a, a new thought world. And therefore, I had to communicate sufficiently respect uh, in, in a genuine way, which wasn't hard to do because I, I respected them profoundly, so that they would partner with me in order to allow me to illuminate how this thought world was going to emerge. So if there's a lesson, you know, I guess the lesson there is that you can't do it alone. You've got to choose your comrades, you've got to choose your allies, and you have to choose your organizational structure so that if you're in a culture that does not support your creativity, or you're asking the far-reaching questions, or you're doing the kinds of uh, exploratory work that will result in ahas and breakthroughs, then you, of course, there are necessities like earning a living and like that. But nevertheless, you have to ask yourself over the long term, 
Is this the place that I want to be? And who are the partners I need? Who is it that is going to support me in being the most creative self? I mentioned my wife was in a panic attack when I said a job I've done well for 20 years, I am renouncing and I'm going to start a whole new venture for the third time in my life. She hadn't gone through that. But she came to support me in doing it. And she says now, you know, if you hadn't done that, you would have suffocated to death. That's the kind of wife I had to have. If it had been, have you seen the movie The Insider? Uh, the tobacco guy who, uh, real whistleblower, an incredible movie. But his wife couldn't go along. She couldn't make the trip with him. She was so locked into what he had been providing that she couldn't do the courageous thing and support him in doing the right thing. So who you partner with has a lot to do with it. Creativity is not something that some people have and some don't. Creativity is natural. Every human being accesses the domain of creativity sometimes. The trick is not that we sometimes do it and sometimes don't. The trick is knowing what is going to make it more likely that we will do it so that we can create those conditions intentionally, consciously, formally in our lives, therefore tend the creativity. Another friend, I'm not trying to nose, name drop from NSA, I'm just trying to say that don't believe me, believe these people who have spent their lives discovering this stuff. Another friend says you cannot make creativity happen, but you can tend it. You can nurture it. You can create the conditions that are likely to make it happen, and then you can capture it when it happens. Now, this same guy does workshops. He, he calls them whole mind workshops or something. And he learned this doing intelligence analysis because he learned that if you just do the granular left brain engineering kind of thinking, you only get so far. But if you add to it the right brain synthetic, imaginative, creative part, this is where the breakthroughs take place. And he talked to a lot of people and said, what are you doing when those ideas pop? Because these are people who, who have great ideas. But often you're off running or uh, swimming or doing, you, you, you're up 4 o'clock in the morning, you're doing something totally else. You're not thinking about the problem consciously that it is about, that's about to pop, like a bubble in a chaos theory. Suddenly not thinking about it, wu wei they call it, right? Not doing. But it doesn't mean not doing. It means doing in a particular not aggressive, active, focused kind of way, but kind of doing it around the back of your brain from the medulla oblongata down, letting it happen, tending it. Then these ideas pop. And if you don't have a means of recording and keeping it at the time, then it's going to go very, very quickly, especially if it's a new or anomalous idea, because it will not fit in with the way you think about the world. I'll talk about that a little more, too. So he encourages people to carry a notebook, carry a recorder, you know, speak into their watch, whatever, whatever it is you've got that works. Because I found, going into big companies, people are creative as hell. But the companies often imprison them in a regimen that is, even the best companies, that is so unforgiving that they don't have time to capture the creativity and the processes, the systemic processes of the culture and company do not encourage them to find time to feed their creativity into the system so that it can be used. I did a three-day conference on creativity with a big company, the biggest company. It was supposed to be on creativity, but the whole three days were so over-programmed that it was clear that it wasn't really about creativity at all. And the guy who brought me in said, toward the end of the second day, I guess you figured out that while you were supposed to do creativity, that wasn't why we were here. This was really a reward to them. It's about retention. I wanted to take them off campus for a, for a fun thing here at the retreat center. And, and suddenly, you're, you know, have you ever been in that situation where you're hired by someone to do one thing, but you're sabotaged and subverted because that's not the real purpose for which you've been brought in? So suddenly, you just feel like you're in a total bind. Can't do it. Can't, damned if you do, damned if you don't. How can you do anything with creativity in an environment that, at its essence, is not really created for creativity? So the culture assimilates us. You remember that picture of Bill Gates? Uh, we will assimilate you as the Borg on the Bulletin Board magazine. Now it's a famous poster. A culture will assimilate you very, very quickly. In the consulting business, we say we're like uh, cucumbers that are going to jump into the brine and we're going to cucumber the brine. But every consultant gets pickled. What that really means is that by the time you begin to interact with a culture seriously, it begins to reward and punish you in subtle and unspoken ways according to unwritten rules that you are not going to find in any employee manual. And therefore, you become part of the system that itself is working against itself. 
Margaret Mead, terrific anthropologist coming of age in Samoa, said that when she went into a foreign culture, it took her one whole year to learn again what she had learned in one week. Because in that first week, like the Zen people say, beginner's mind, everything is new and fresh. And she could see it clearly. And then by the end of the week, she was already being sucked in. The 99% of us that is unconscious was being incorporated into the culture. And it took her a whole year to learn again what she had learned in that one week. So what is it that works against your creativity? Even when you are reasonably young, I think it is your very success and the things you're really great at. The things you are best at keep you from seeing that the shadow or dark side or whatever other parts of you are unexpressed that would add to that whole have not really been tended or nurtured. John Seely Brown said at Xerox, the more success you achieve, either as an individual or organization, the more difficult it is to change. All the learning that leads to one kind of success becomes implicitly coded and works against your ability to unlearn. And yet, during times of radical change, unlearning quickly as well as learning, emptying the cup, as the Zen people say, is one of the things you have to do. I never finished that thought about Jay Heiser. I brought him up and then I went off on a segue about my life. Jay Heiser was saying, what is this cowboy stuff, this white hat hacker business? Now you go back 10, 15 years, when I was doing that stuff with the Apple II, back in the early 80s, what was being said about cyberspace? First of all, Neuromancer was just, just coining the term. I know it's, I know, you don't want to hear it, we need a better term, just like hacker, cr cracker, you start all that stuff. You have to look at the language in context. But cyberspace as an event was just coming up. And you look back at what some people, like John Perry Barlow, how many of you know who John Perry Barlow is? Of course, of course. Do you know I was at InfoSec World uh, earlier this week in Orlando, and there were hundreds of people in the room, and I asked uh, how many knew who John Perry Barlow was, and you know there was one hand that went up, Joe Klein, bless his heart, one hand went up way at the back of the room, and so then I had to go to the next level and say how many of you know who the Grateful Dead were, <laughs> you know, and, and then you get the cackle, but. Uh, Boy, John Perry Barlow wrote stuff about cyberspace that, if you read it now, sounds so fanciful and out of sight. Sounds like he was in Sky City with Lando Calrissian, you know, just kind of floating above the hole. The independence of the mind. We are creating a new civilization of the mind, more humane and more fair. We are not in meat space. We reject your attempts to colonize us. We repudiate your laws, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's, that's the myth. That's the myth. When people are in the myth and believe the myth, they don't know it's a myth. In other words, the things we deeply believe to be true often are mythical, but we don't know it, and therefore we believe them. When we see it's a metaphor, you say, well, yeah, but John Perry Barrow wasn't, he didn't really mean that. Number one, he did. <laughs> he meant it literally. Number two, by the time you get to the point you say, well, it was just a metaphor, then you've moved out of the myth and you no longer believe it as myth. It is no longer foundational and central to your life. And then you get to the science where you describe it objectively. Well, yeah, what was happening historically then and the science of it is this. And by the time you get there, and that's really what Jay Hunter was saying when he said, what is this cowboy stuff? Everybody knew once upon a time what the cowboy stuff, white hat, black hat, gray hat hackers were about. And now, now he's saying, we're not cowboys. What that means is the context has so shifted that you must use images, language, ideas appropriate to what people believe so that you can communicate effectively with them. Yeah. And uh, what, is a, what is a white hat hacker anyway? You know, in my book, a white hat hacker is a black hat hacker who forgot how to tell the truth. Right? And a gray hat hacker is a white hat hacker who doesn't remember where he put it in the first place. You know, the truth is, once upon a time, and maybe in some ways still, the only way to get certain kinds of information, understanding, and learning is to hack. And I mean that in all the meanings of the word. And you know that. Everybody knows that. That's why I could say honestly and sincerely to the first DEF CON to which I spoke in a talk called Hacking is Practice for Transplanetary Life in the 21st Century. I said, it's not your behavior that is a problem for the authorities. It is your perceived allegiance. In other words, if you come in under the cover of CIA or DIA or FBI or NSA, you can hack your hearts out. You can do things which in any other context would be illegal and felonious. It would get you in jail for life. But if you do it on behalf of your nation, you are a hero and a patriot. 
It is not the behavior. It is the allegiance. It's not the ideology. It is who you do it for and to. OK. Now, was there a hand up over here? I believe he lives in Wyoming and continues. To, I don't know. Is he still writing stuff like that? Uh, I know he was part of part of the whole epic thing, and a bit EFF, right? He's lost. He's lost the myth. Okay, where is it? What's his site? Do you know. Okay. So there's your answer. He's still doing stuff. But you know, the battle, I mean, I know this is going to sound fanciful and like it's far away. But as we get older, the battle is not to become bitter at the loss of the myth and the loss of the memory. It's just what happens. The things we fought for then, I mean, I'm on a, well, I won't, I won't even go into it. Uh, but my last column, I don't know if any of you read this stuff. I'll give a couple of these away, sell the others. Uh, Islands in the Clickstream, it's free. It's on my website. All you have to do is go get it or sign up for it, and I'll send it to you uh, intermittently, not very frequently. And um, uh, the last column I wrote was called I Was a Victim of the KGB. And what it was was using as a point of departure a thing written by uh, Jean Potit. Now, Jean had been a CIA guy for 30 years, and he was very, very good at what he did. Radar is what he told me about once upon a time, interesting things, like he would use Back in the 60s, when they were, they were just learning to put radar images on the radar of the enemy, uh, what did this mean? It meant that when we wanted to probe and test the defenses of the Soviet Union or their allies, we didn't have to send planes. We could actually simulate the sending of a plane. In their radar, we could do it any size, any speed. Mo we could simulate or model any known aircraft. And therefore, they would respond appropriately. And we could test their defenses by simply imposing a false radar image on it. And he had great stories, like the time the Cubans, uh, the Cubans scrambled some jets to chase the jets they thought were in their airspace after we put bogus uh, images on their radar. And they intercepted, NSA is real time, right? So they intercepted a Cuban pilot saying, I see it, I see it. And they said, shoot it down, shoot it down. Well, they don't know what the hell he was seeing because there was nothing there. But they looked at each other, and they nodded, and they killed the image. And so for all intents and purposes, the Cuban pilot thought he had fired his missile and had a kill because whatever it was he was chasing had disappeared immediately uh, from his radar. So this is a pretty good guy. But here he is saying that the, the uh, 1970s, the uh, church committee and the Pike committee were disinformation campaigns by the KGB. Now this one's a stretch. How many of you know what the church committee hearings were about and the Pike committee hearings? Okay. Richard and the old guy, the silverback, right, who has lived through all this. Well, it was pretty serious stuff. You know, I mean, Watergate assassinations, uh, the assassinations, in case you don't remember, they were all on the left. All of our dynamic, charismatic leadership was assassinated. Now, it was John Kennedy, and it was Robert Kennedy, and it was Malcolm X, and it was Martin Luther King Jr., and it was Medgar Evers, and it was Fred Hampton. And you know, despite the squeaky films of the world, everybody who was killed was on the left. And it usually seemed to be done with a conspiratorial lilt to it. No one will go back and look at the data about the Kennedy assassination without coming to the conclusion that there was something going on beyond a random act by some crazy person. So I was responding to that and going back to the Church and Pike Committee hearings. And I got an email from a guy who said, you may notice my name. I'm the one who blew the whistle on Casey. Uh, Casey was the director of the CIA. The, uh, and Reagan in the Iran-Contra event. And everything you said, and go look at that article. Everything you said in that article, he said, was accurate. It's this overview of the last 55 years of what has happened to the space of truth in our lives by, as a result of living in a cave of absolute secrecy that, honest to God, didn't used to be there. It didn't used to be like this. That's what memory can provide. But at any rate, that's getting back to saying the fight is against bitterness. The fight is against becoming discouraged. The fight is somehow always to find a way to resuscitate in your mind and heart the belief and the values that are behind this passion for creativity in the first place. OK, any, any other questions before I move on with a? Uh, Casey, really, 
really end up in Argentina? Casey is dead. <laughs> I thought he was in Argentina. No, you're thinking of Claus Barbie. <laughs> that was Casey's good friend. <laughs> no, I don't. Th I think Casey genuinely died on that trip, right? He's uh, three plots down from my grandfather. What? He's buried three plots down from my grandfather. He's well, you mean there's a gravestone and a hump of earth? Five plots down. He died. The gravestone actually said former director of the Central Intelligence. <laughs> okay. There you are. No, it, was, it was the fate that done that five years earlier. So at least the legend is dead, and he's probably in the uh, witness protection program. So he's probably a barista at a Starbucks in <laughs> San Jose, right? <laughs> now he's dead. As far as I know, he's dead. And, uh, anybody else? Yes? When you're dealing with these hierarchical corporate <laughs> agencies that have these inbred cultures, Fight creativity. Yes. How do you actually approach them when you're a creative person and they look at you like you're an alien? Um, well, first of all, you put the head on with the big eyes and the big head. <laughs> so when they say you look like an alien, you can take it off and they say you still look like an alien. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, all right, let me let me go off on a module that will answer that. Um, I think it, at least there are a number of alternatives. People, you can't keep people from being creative, but it will squeak out. Uh, it will ooze out at the sides. But you can be more formal about it. Uh, let me use as an example uh, Becky Bast. You know the name? She's done a lot of writing on intrusion detection. Uh, Becky was at NSA, but she had learned growing up the hard way. Her father was a northern Alabama dirt farmer, and her mother was a Japanese aristocrat brought over from Tokyo after the war by her father, who was there as part of our troops. And she was raised half Japanese, first woman to become a graduate in engineering at the University of Alabama. I mean, she had some things, some mountains over which she had to climb in order to get where she was, and uh, made her a little bristly. When she got to NSA, the predominantly white male hierarchy did not take kindly to this blustery uh, half Japanese woman who knew a lot more than a lot of the people around her. So she created what we call uh, a functional network. And this is the way Becky described it. She needed something to be done. So if you did it the formal way, then you would go through channels and you would get the budgetary processes all lined up and you would do everything according to the book. Well, she knew they would never approve what she wanted to get done. Her goal was to do the task. In other words, she wasn't kidding or lying to anybody about what it is she wanted. This is what we're supposed to be about in this agency. This is the kind of quality work I want to do. So that was her first passion. And then she would go to people, say, at CIA. Now, at that time, it was anathema. You never went across the river to CIA. There, there were blood, blood feuds going on between the two agencies. In fact, um, I think some people are convinced that, this, that what we think of as the CIA, Langley and all that, is in fact a front which is designed to keep people off guard because of the quality of their work. Well, there is in fact a secret CIA somewhere else that is doing intelligence on behalf of the United States. But <laughs> be that as it may, uh, so she'd get some CIA people. Now look at the academics she worked with, some of the younger people she would spot. She developed an intuitive knack for picking out people who had a clue. It's being clueful. And so she would assemble this team, CIA, NSA, people from academia, all of whom were committed to the task and organized around it. Then there's the problem of funding, but you can always find some two-star general somewhere. You know how they do military budgets. There's always 20% fat in every budget. So he could say, yeah, what do you need, 80,000, 800,000? I think we can, we can find the money for that. So in an ad hoc way, what she would do is informally create a kind of skunk works by showing the initiative and above all being supremely capable of seeing it through to the end in order to achieve the task they could all see really needed to be done. And in that way, she really demonstrated leadership. And the, the cool thing about network technologies is it really has transformed the way power can be exercised. I mean, I think all of you in this room probably know that. That power belongs to the person at the node. The node really is the center of the network. And the edge is the center. And therefore, anyone at any node at any time can exercise leadership in the same way that she did. What she did, in effect, was exercise her radical freedom, if you want, 
to say, I look like I'm a node in this hierarchical structure, but in fact, I'm going to redefine the node in this way in relationship to these other people. Power is redefining relationship for people around a common goal or good or task. And anyone can do it. That's why other than assassinating you, which is the ultimate form of censorship, they can't stop you from being creative. They can inhibit you and make it difficult, but they can't stop you. So she exercised the kind of leadership which networks give people genuinely, as opposed to a hierarchy which teaches you to dominate and control as a way to exercise power. A network tells you to exercise power by participating and contributing. We see it on the web all the time, and all of you know it viscerally from your experience. But I'm telling you that 20 years ago when I would talk to people in business, they didn't know this. They literally had no clue. This had not yet happened and transformed the way they experienced power. And as a result of that, leadership, that's why I kept, no matter what I was talking about, change or, or uh, organizational effectiveness or quality or diversity, all of it ultimately came from technology. That's what I came to see. It all came from technological transformation and how it was redefining what it meant to be human and to be capable of doing things that literally had not been available to us before. The speed of information really moves faster and organizational structures morph, they transform, they flip into the forms appropriate to the speed of information in a, in a system. So what does leadership mean in a system such as we now all inhabit? The best metaphor I know for that comes from a friend who did whitewater kayaking. And he said, you know, when you're coming up to the rapids and you're looking ahead at the rocks and rapids, he said, I've noticed that whenever you look at the rocks, you always hit the rocks. Whenever you look at where the water goes, you always go where the water goes. Now, that's a way of defining leadership metaphorically in that leadership today, in the conditions I've been describing, consists of seeing clearly where the water goes and saying it. What Becky Bass was doing when she created functional networks for intrusion detection at NSA was seeing clearly where they needed to go and saying it clearly. And that's when leadership happens. It's, you know, I, I mean, I remember a guy at a big corporation who was learning about quality programs and he told people they had to get into it and he came out and he's on the balcony and here's 500 people and he came out and he said, you're all empowered. And he went back to his office. Because literally, he had no idea he had to create the organizational structures that supported empowerment, or what they even were. But when people went back to their little cubicle space, there's always somebody, some man, some woman, who says, well, you know, they've, they've accepted the mantle of leadership unconsciously and said, well, you know, I think I know what he meant. I think he meant this. She's the leader. She's the node that is now directing the energies of the organizational structure on behalf of a task or goal. She's doing it because she's got a report but she has the leadership because she has the capability. So that's one of the things you do. I mean, if you think of the different things I've said so far, you find the allies who will work with you. You intuitively, you make mistakes, but you find out who's really committed to doing this thing. Uh, a hacker culture is a meritocracy in spades. You know how it works. I mean, the real hacker cultures, as they have evolved over time, people would come and say, I want you to teach me how to hack a, you know, something, and they'd just be dismissed as of no account. But if someone did the homework, if someone really stayed up all night at Barnes & Noble, surrounded by O'Reilly books, and tried everything they knew, and then they brought a question that was obviously informed by their trying and not quite getting it to the group online, on IRC, or to a news group in the old days, when you recognize the sincerity and the capability of the person asking the question, you acknowledged it by responding, by giving them what they needed to know. There's always help. And as you moved up the line and gained the knowledge, you had to do a lot of it yourself, but that extra part came from the mutuality of the group. And then the people who were truly elite would emerge and become known for what they had, which was high skill at doing things that previously had not been able to be done. So then they become leaders. And then when they exercise power on behalf of the network, the network responds and people coalesce around them. So it's not a trivial process, but... Uh, I think that's what's required. Does that make sense? As one, it's not the only way. I don't know. You know does anybody else want to respond to him? Anybody, I'm sure. Uh, his question way back when was, all right, so you find yourself assimilated, shut down, hampered, inhibited by some organizational culture that's impeding you. How do you get around it? In other words, how do you build a miniature skunk works uh, formally or informally, or what other ways can you be effective in order to remain creative in a job that is stultifying? Well, 
One of the things that uh, you commonly see is a lot of people end up getting tasked with uh, jobs that fall within their job category and any kind of sharing between different strata, not generally, you know, smile upon. So happy games and things like that start being a way to distribute knowledge and have a challenge that allows you to bring together multiple skills. And that's where a lot of the IRC stuff comes from. People come together who have a lot of different jobs uh -huh. and talk about things they've learned professionally, which aren't really public knowledge. A lot of the techniques stuff you don't learn by uh, just fucking around. You end up learning by seeing other people doing it. Right. You know, monkey see, monkey do. So, being able to see that technique, that's something that's unique to IRC because it's not something you think to put in a website. Doing something. In other words, it's interactive, it's participatory? Well, uh, it's not so much participatory. You're really expected to do most of it sort of underneath the covers. Uh, but what ends up happening is everybody sort of has to bug out and brag or beg for a little bit of information. And then somebody will go on a rant for pages about <laughs> this obscenely obscure feature that they had to put with once and learned it in depth and just will feel dumb. And it's beautiful. Got it. Got it. It's a great answer. Yes? Um, one of the things which is sort of along those lines is to foster creativity outside of work. If you're in an environment where you can't, you're having trouble exuding creativity inside of work, is to be sure that you create activities outside of work which can keep that strong, keep that sharp, and hobbies and other such things so it'll keep that side of you alive and going. So even when you hit the roadblocks at work, you can still have an outlet for it in your life. Excellent. Forget about it. Yeah, I don't want to lose that because I want to use that as a point of departure. Yeah. I think saying work is kind of a lack of imagination. I think we should probably be saying role what happens in society and creativity. OK, that's good. OK. Um, in, in terms of doing things outside of your role, which do call forth certain and constrained sets of attributes from you as a rule. Uh, let, me, let me refer to some of the brilliant people. Like I, I like to use uh, Becky Bass. Uh, here's Peter Neumann. Anybody know who Peter Neumann is? Familiar with that name? SRI, Multics. One of the founders of Multics works at SRI. Uh, Great, great. Glad. Go to his website if you don't know who he is, Peter Neumann. And uh, he uh, hosts the, the Risks Digest. Every, a lot of people get that, right? Uh, so Peter Neumann is terrific. Um, this is what he told me. We had a great conversation. And he said, you know, most people you normally run into don't think in terms of the big picture. And that's what you're talking about. How do you expand your mind in order to see more and more and more of the things you don't see? I mean, Buckminster Fuller said it should be cross-disciplinary. Uh, he had the idea for the geodesic dome by studying the eye of the honeybee, right? So you go to disciplines that challenge you in ways you are not previously challenged. And that reminds me of something else that I hope I remember later. OK, so he said, some kid will think, gee, I can write some C code, so I'm a programmer. And he thinks he's a software engineer. The kid who wrote the Xerox 25 code did not have a clue as to what was life critical. He'd never written anything like that. But the company that hired him didn't have a clue either. He said, you only get a clue if you look at how the left brain and the right brain work together. And he mentioned Munch, the uh, conductor of the Boston Symphony, who said the right hand draws and the left hand colors. He said, the left brain is linear, and logical, and rational. The right is intuitive and imaginative. What do you need to do uh, to be a musician? You need balance. What do you need in the holistic computer field? You need exactly the same thing. The left brain is the guy who will learn C++ and crank out code like crazy. There's all sorts of cute little tricks, but doesn't have a clue as to how it fits into anything else. He has no sense of the system whatsoever. The right brain guy turns out code without any understanding of the details of the language. He uses what he needs to get something to work, but he doesn't have a sense of architecture, like an engineer, and how it all fits together. The only people who are useful in a holistic sense have integrated left and right brains and can see the big picture and cut across all this nonsense. It is incredibly rare, he said. There are very few people who can deal with details and see the big picture at the same time. And he gave us an example, Ron Rivest, 
uh, they were talking about crypto and voting machines. And Ron Rivest, pretty good, pretty bright guy, uh, had come up with his elaborate systems. And Neumann said to him, yes, the, the crypto is really, really good, but the machine is broken. The system is broken. And Rivest said, and I quote, that's not my problem. <laughs> That's not my problem. As long as the, you know, which is why somebody else said cryptography is the opiate of the naive. Cryptography is the, I don't remember who said that, but it was cool. And it, it, because you're always going to build a system that you cannot query, because the rules are implicitly in the engineered system, but you cannot ask it what it knows. And therefore, you don't find out until trial and error. I mean, torpedo. Uh, it's, it's a true story. They developed this terrific torpedo, and they were testing it. So they're, Submarine testing torpedo, helicopter flying over the water, and let it go, and here comes the torpedo, and it comes up toward the submarine, and then, surprise, it didn't stop. In other words, it came out of the water and leaped through the air into the open door of the submarine, and I mean the helicopter. And now these guys are going crazy because this torpedo is continuing to bounce around inside the helicopter. Uh, they managed to get it out, and they survived that incident. But what they discovered is they had forgotten to program some kind of end rule for the torpedo, such that when you break the surface of the water, stop. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just like uh, you know, that thing we crashed on Mars because they hadn't translated uh, the, the numbers. It just had, had forgotten. All right, so, so uh, Neumann says, you know, you, you can develop this. This is the good news. This is part of creativity. And this is a way to say there are practical things you can do. Uh, the brain, we have discovered, has a quality we call neuroplasticity. It will generate neurons in the areas of knowledge or understanding that you choose to do. Uh, for example, Braille. You know, my fingertip, I don't, I don't do Braille. So my fingertip is not terribly sensitive. But if I was blind and I was learning Braille, what would happen by prolonged use is that my brain would begin growing at any age. This is the good news for silverbacks. It really is. You never, ever have to stop learning. At any age, the brain will generate the neuronal structure needed to learn that which you direct it to do. And so if you're doing this, if I go blind at 80, I will generate greater sensitivity in my fingertips. I mean, a study that was similar to that they did with monkeys. They rubbed the monkey's arm, right? And they discovered that the brain in the monkey generated the neuronal structure that was sensitive to having its arm rubbed. Then they gave the monkey M&Ms. They still did everything exactly the same, rubbed his arm and so on, but distracted him by offering him food, sex, or, well, that's it, right? I mean, for me, that's it, food or sex. Uh, and so he was, they were doing this, but he saw he's looking over here. It did not generate the neuronal structure. In other words, your attention and intention is what determines what you will learn. You know, if there's one thing you remember, it is that those things about which you do not think you are very good, you are capable of becoming extraordinarily good in those areas if you focus and intend to learn them, and then you will. And in computer security, you have to, because I've been able to talk for Medtronic. <laughs> And this, the head of IT got up and he said, you know, it used to be good enough to be good at IT to be good at IT. So all you needed to be good at IT was be good at IT. Now you need extremely good communication skills. And you, know to how, you have to know how to really understand the business case. Because the people who fund and buy security see it as a risk management tool now, increasingly a compliance in Orlando, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all these workshops, that's how I get markers. Compliance, compliance, compliance. Yeah, it can mean that the more you have good compliance, the less secure you are, but that doesn't matter. You will have compliance. And therefore, you have to understand the business case, even if you have to surreptitiously develop good security around the compliance. So you have to know how to talk to the people, and that means you know, some of the geeks I know, some of the geeks I know, not all, but some, uh, you know, interpersonal interaction and uh, communication skills are not necessarily their strongest suits. And they can learn to do that just as I have gotten a clue about what computing is about because it was my weakest suit. My 12-year-old opened the box, took out the apple, read the program, read the manual, and began programming. That's how he's making his living now. Built a company in Silicon Valley, and it's profitable. He never took a course in programming. 
I stood behind him and realized, that's when I realized, if I'm going to function in the world that's emerging, I have got to be a little more humble and approach my own children with humility and patience. And if I'm really kind, they will be patient and teach me what I need to know in order to partner with them. So, hand was up. Technically, people like Green Rail also lose sensitivity to their calluses and fingers. There's always some geek who's going to throw in a fact <laughs> like that. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I've got to change the example, but you get the idea. And that turned the clock off. Oh, well. Uh, anybody else? You know, I think I heard the word play. You know, one, of, one of the things I talk about is where do you go to see what's coming on the edges, and I mentioned the kids. Uh, you are all at ages now where you are not kids, right? But there are people who you say, oh, they're kids. And that means the people who are right where you were. And so you go to the kids, whoever the kids are to see what they're playing with. Um, you know, sometimes you do this formally. Sony, when they developed the PlayStation, the engineers brought in a bunch of 10 and 11-year-olds and gave them prototypes. And then they stood behind one-way glass and watched what they did with it. And the kids, being classic hackers, i.e. having no preconceptions about what they were supposed to do with it, invented ways to use the PlayStation that the engineers at Sony themselves had never dreamed of doing. So you, in effect, they were partnering with the kids by saying, how do you play? Well, you always go to see how a society is beginning unconsciously to teach its youngest members what they need to know. When Legos and robots were fused, I knew that robotics was, if not already, the way of the future. Because you needed to know how to program robots, or at least how to live comfortably with robotic structures, as we have all grown to do. Uh, one of my favorite examples of that came the other day from Milwaukee uh, when I was waiting in line at the IMAX. Uh, oh, here's a guy, London Business School. The best learning takes place through play. Not playing with Nerf balls and hula hoops. I'm talking about playing with representations of reality. And that's what you all do all the time on the web. Once upon a time, that was a new thing. Marvin Minsky at MIT. Is that a name any people still know? Society of Mind? Um, Minsky said, you know, what, what is it that's happening? As he was trying to help people understand the emergence of the internet. Oh, a battery came out. No wonder it doesn't work. <laughs> An engineering solution. He said, what it is that's happening on the internet? He says, let me try to help you understand this. He says, what do we mean by thinking? By thinking, he means, he said, the ability to manage in your mind simultaneously, juxtapose, contradictory sometimes representations of reality, and hold them agnostically in your mind while you entertain streams of data to decide which is more or less a good enough map of reality for now. Thinking is managing multiple representations of reality. And then he said, and where is thinking taking place today? It is taking place on the network. He's trying to make the point for people who are still asking the question, do I need to know this stuff? When I, a few years ago, not anymore, but just a few years ago, I would go in, there'd be 50 and up white male people in the room, and, we'd, and they'd want me to tell them how their industry was going to be affected by this. And I would say, you really have to answer a prior question, which is how you're going to be around. Because half of them were figuring out when they were going to die or retire. And if they could make that line in a sprint without having to listen, they were not going to learn anything about it. Well, now that's not true. We all have to do it. And Minsky was saying, where thinking for humankind is and will take place is on the web, on our networked means of extending our cognition and sensory apparatus into the universe. And therefore, if you do not know how to use the web and the net effectively, you are like a computer on a desk in a corner. You are no different than a brain in a bottle. Because the language of the tribe, the dialect of the tribe, it's like being raised by wolves in a cave. You may know some things, but you don't know the dialect of the tribe. And that's why he was saying it was becoming ubiquitous. Yes? If the web is where the expand thinking, tap into other people's thoughts, resources, and so forth, how do you mitigate that in that arena? You know I mean? Oh, I know exactly what you mean. I'm just avoiding your question. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm playing with my toy. Uh, good question. Um, one of the ways to do it is to redefine 
theft. You know, when British Rail found out they had a terrible on-time record, the worst in Europe, and they needed to get better, you know how they fixed it? They redefined the word late <laughs> to mean any plane, uh, any train that arrived up to uh, one and a half hours of the uh, printed timetable time, and their on-time uh, record improved dramatically. <laughs> right. I'm only half kidding. Let me tell you why. All right, that that gets another rift, and I'll try to make it short because you know I know it's late. But uh, you know about light waves and particles, right? And you know you test for a particle, you get a particle, and you test for a wave, you get a wave. And at first we said, I don't understand this. What is, what is? How can it be a particle and a? Is it one or the other? No, it's a wave and it's a particle. You test for one, you get one. You test for the other, you get the other. I have a hunch that a lot of the conversations we have about intellectual property and privacy and information security are a function of being caught between is it a particle or is it a wave. But we're not talking about particles and waves. We're talking about human identity as we conceive of it and the attributes of human identity from the individual person all the way up to the largest geopolitical structures. So uh, let's take uh, boundaries. How do you, how do you define a, a self? It's where do you draw the boundary? Right? So where have we been drawing boundaries in civilization? Nation states emerged in the 17th, 18th, 19th century as a way to organize the flow of information appropriate to the economic, social, and political realities of the time. In other words, we didn't need such large aggregates of structure until the flow of information became sufficiently fast to require them. In other words, nation states into which we've all been born are on their way out because the technology is in the process of undermining and, and, and destroying them from under. Now, you understand that. You know that, I mean, when I was a kid, I would go to Europe, and you had to show your passport at the Spanish border and the French border, and they were distinct countries, and now you know it's just all kind of, they're still distinct countries, kind of, but they're morphing into Europe and the European Union. So at every level, whether you want to look at countries or whether you want to look at transglobal organizational structures or you want to look at individuals, where we thought the boundary was drawn around our identities has been undermined by technological change. Now, the self, when I use a word like self or individual, you know, what is very hard for us to really get because it's so axiomatic to the way we think is that those concepts didn't exist before the printing press. You know, I just can't emphasize that enough. Before the Renaissance, we did not have a concept of human rights. We did not have a concept of intellectual property rights. We did not have a concept of author. None of those things that we take for granted as givens in society literally existed. Just as there was no such thing as adolescence. Do you know that the word adolescence did not exist prior to the 1450s? It began to emerge later in the 1400s because the printing press engineered processes which postponed adulthood for the first time in human history, while younger people assimilated symbolically the knowledge that had accumulated in their tribe or organization or culture or society, and therefore had to wait, which is why you know, we all have so much trouble. Post the hormones fire, the evolutionary development of hormones didn't know that, but we have to somehow cold cock our hormones for 10 years while we're supposedly postponing adulthood. You know, you read Romeo and Juliet, they were 12 and 13 years old uh, because people were grown up at 12 and 13. And there was no concept of childhood either. These things that which we think are so fundamental and axiomatic. So when you're talking about privacy, are you looking at the individual as bounded by a border which says that you can contain your information? Or are you looking at what computing and networking technologies have taught us, which is that we're on our way to an identity that is collective, and in which the membranes of our cell are semi-permeable and information and energy is passing through them always, as we now know from the physical world uh, it, it in fact is. So if you look at the individual self, you say, I must have privacy. But if you look at the other self that has been defined by computing, it's not even a self exactly, it's a collective. Uh, just as we've been talking about, you need all these other people. See, that, that literally didn't exist before. And one of the obvious ways to see it is in education. Uh, when, 
You know, I, I went to help a school district once in Northern Illinois that was struggling with uh, getting bad grades from Baxter Labs and Motorola and uh, Abbott Labs. And they said, you're doing everything right, but you're not doing a good job in teaching the kids to work collaboratively and to think collaboratively. And I said, well, what does that mean? And the answer that came back made me think, you know what they called collaborative learning in my day? They called it cheating. <laughs> And I realized that it was funny, but it was true. I was taught to have blinders on, like this. I was supposed to do my own work. I heard that voice from the teacher so many times. Don't look at Bruce Rockwell's paper. I can hear it through the years. I was, in fact, a pioneer in collaborative learning, but I was not being acknowledged <laughs> for it. But when you look at how people are taught to work cooperatively today, and then in the workplace to do teamwork, you know, I'm trying to tell you that those concepts in that form did, literally did not exist, that the whole concept of education has been completely turned on its ear. And you can mark the points uh, of, its, of its movement. So, so the question you're asking is a good one, but I think it matters from what point of view we're asking it. From one point of view, I mean, I put all my stuff, yeah, I hope people will, will buy this. Not that many are, but the ones who are like it. Islands in the Clickstream, you can have one for 20 bucks. They retail for 30. If the book guy was here, you'd have to pay 30. You can get it from me for 20, signed. You can get it on Amazon for 4.99. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the other thing that's happening in the book industry. These books were out and available for less than 24 hours when it began showing up, quote unquote, used on Amazon. Because the distribution channels haven't quite factored in uh, how you can get a hold of books and make them available Im immediately. I'll also give two away uh, at, at the end, which makes you stay. Yeah, go ahead. Let, let me then put it in context. If you're an individual with a contribution in this collective network community, um, where is your value? And I don't mean the euphoric. No, I understand. People will just simply take it. How do you measure your value? And how do you put boundaries around it and how do you secure it? That's, it's a great question. And I'm just suggesting that we do not yet have the answer. And, and, and we don't have the answer for the same reasons that when we're doing counterterror. Uh, ports, I, I, I mean, in terms of boundaries going down, think about the, the terrible challenge it posed. Our commitment had been to globalism. Uh, our empire is built on quote unquote free trade, which means markets everywhere for us, and, and we will take resources, and we will send goods, and you will get poor, and we will have more. And that's the way we've been running the world for 50 years, as much as, of it as we can, and after the Cold War, it's the whole thing, uh, kind of. All right, so we wanted boundaries down, free trade, ease of travel. It's no different than the information security problem. It was a trade-off. You know that in the DARPA days, right? Either you want access or you want security, and that's still a big part of the problem. So. Suddenly terrorism rears its ugly head, and we've got to do all kinds of things that would inhibit the free flow of goods. And we still haven't solved the problem of tankers and, and containers and ships. We're doing a lot of things about it, you know, trying to make it, take it all the way back to the origin and the source and, and tracking it back there before it gets to our shores. But the truth is, it's a trade-off. How can you have the free flow of goods and at the same time inhibit every single granular piece that might contain a piece of a dirty bomb that's going to reassemble inside? And it is very much like computer security. And somebody showed me an app, Java app, the other day. It's just so clever, you know. And it breaks itself down into little pieces, and they go right through the firewall. You can't, you know. And then there's one piece that reassembles the other pieces inside, and you got a program functional inside the firewall. It's ingenious, you know. But it defeated the whole purpose of application server security. Um, and uh, people who saw it in that space just, oh, holy, sh you know, <laughs> it's like that. So these these are very difficult problems. It's trade-offs. And the hackers that are good, some of you may be them. But the ones who I talk to tell me that, you know, we have zero days, we've owned this, we don't need to do viruses, we own the boxes. We travel in small, stealthy groups. You don't know our names, you don't know the names of our real groups. We only trust one another. Nobody brags, nobody tells anybody what we've got. We know how to watermark stuff, we know how to give people wares that we can track through the net and see who they really are. And we have zero days galore coming out of our ears, exploits coming out of our ears because there's so many, and by the time they show up 18 months later, you know, this big argument about disclosure is for them a smokescreen. 
uh, because the real work has already been done a year, two years earlier, and we own your boxes. And then when you look at who the hackers are, I mean, that was my big surprise. I started to, as I mentioned, I went to DEF CON 10 years ago. I did talk at the Pentagon about six months ago, and one third of the people in the room I knew from DEF CON. But at DEF CON, they're dressed, you know, like, like this, black, black and dreads and, you know, the whole thing. I think they're wigs, because there they were, you know, protecting the backbone. So the problem is that when you ask those questions to hackers, then you realize that, of course, the same people, as I said to the hackers, inside are not only doing it, but doing it in spades. The best hackers are inside. They have the Trojans. They have the back doors. They're built that way from the ground up, and they always have been. Do you think we're going to export <laughs> shipments of, of, of Windows boxes that are impregnable? Are you kidding? In a dangerous world? I mean, just. If we really wanted to get into what's really true about that whole space, you'd realize that there are layered levels of reality, you know, different contradictory narratives that different people believe according to their need to know. And that can often be a psychological need as well as a compartmentalized need. But OK, my clock is working, but it's uh, always 12 o'clock and blinking. So, so it's working kind of. <laughs> Uh, by one definition. I don't know what, what time it is. It's after 9, right? OK, let me, let me just read this thing then. Uh, I'll do a little bit more. Uh, I talked about play, and I was about to read what I thought was the coolest thing. Then I got sidetracked. Uh, I'm standing next to this museum shop waiting to go in the IMAX. And this is what, the, what they're selling. They just have a poster. This is what they're selling at the museum shop. Off-world gear. Weapons for the mind. So, weapons for the mind. Think about that. Remote viewing, ESP, psychokinesis, weapons for the mind. Mind control, use of drugs, hypnosis, mentoring, candidate stuff. We've been doing that for 60 years. You know that, right? 60 years we've been doing that stuff. Sirhan, Sirhan. Uh, cyber pets, idea generators, cosmic debris, alien life forms, space armor, space junk, and thought reactors. Now, if my hypothesis is correct, that we go to see what the children are playing with in order to see what's coming next. Now, you start to get the idea, not only is it coming next, but if it can be formulated like this, it is not only next, it's here. Because things move from the edge to the center. This is something I profoundly believe, and it hasn't been contradicted. That by the time a new idea has moved from the edge to the center and has become the core of a consensus, it is obsolete. In other words, by the time everybody is in compliance, compliance is insecure. Because the network, by definition, has been changing. Meantime, exploits have been found. And the compliance about the boxes of which you can check is no longer compliance to a secure map. If this is what kids are playing with, all I'm suggesting is you want to be creative. How do you think the unthinkable? Think about what my friend at NSA said. How do you free the mind? How do you think the unthinkable? UFOs. How many of you think UFOs have a chance of being something objective and real? All right, not very many. Well, a few. As the consensus builds, people feel more comfortable coming in, <laughs> look around, say, all right, yeah, I like leather. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I didn't know everybody. Are you in the? Okay. All right, so that's, that's how consensus builds. We give each other permission to be the individuals that we are. Um, so I use UFO stories as, as a way to uh, uh, just show people what it is about anomalous data and what it does to the mind, because this is the heart of creativity. And then I'll kind of shut this down. But back when I was a priest, I mean, the reason that's relevant is because the conversations people have confidentially with their priests are usually sincere. They may be uh, confused or perplexed, but they're usually sincere. And my first little parish was on the edge of Hill Air Force Base in Utah. And the senior warden, which is the principal lay officer of the parish, was a guy who was at that time a major. He retired a full bird colonel. He was the kind of guy who had the right stuff. You know? I mean, he's short, right, so he's cocky, right? Had a cowboy hat on, you know, mere shades, stogie, flak jacket, Levi's, cowboy boots. 
he'd kind of come into the church, you know, just kind of settled, didn't have to say anything, you know, and everybody would kind of gather around because he had authority. He had, he had that sense of from within him that had given him so many medals that he never wore for us. He never talked about what he did in Vietnam, heroic things that save lives. He's that kind of guy. He really had the right stuff. 1978, Close Encounters of the Third Kind has just recently come out. Cool movie. I'm from Northwestern, right? So I've read, Alan Heineck was there, uh, Scientific Inquiry, uh, the astronomer who worked with Project Blue Book. And, and so I was interested, and Jacques Vallée was there, who wrote a lot of other books on UFOs, a computer scientist of a high um, quality. And so I said, Bob, you know, all I know about these UFO things is what I read, and what I read is that you guys and your fastest fighters chase these things and you can't catch them. Now, Bob's a cocky little guy, right? And he always had this kind of smirk on his face. But I'll never forget that what happened to him, you know, he just kind of looked perplexed. And instead of being a straight ahead kind of guy as he always was, he just kind of turned away and he says, well, you're right. We chase the goddamn things and we can't catch them. Now, when I tell that story to corporate audiences, the intention is for them to then become aware of the quality of the silence in the room. It's, it's here too, right? What you're listening to is your mind clanking to a stop. Because here's a guy who's just commended himself to you as reasonably intelligent and articulate and certainly has some credibility. And he's suddenly presenting you with an image of credibility of an Air Force officer with the right stuff that doesn't fit your belief system. Because what that guy told me and I'm telling you is that they're real. Okay, end of the entertainment. <laughs> now, the silence is the mind trying to come back and forth as it bounces from an anomalous datum that doesn't fit. See, that's the purpose of telling that story. It's also subliminally to prepare you for the landing. <laughs> because I work for two masters. I don't want to be eaten. I voted for photos. It's funny what happens after you tell that story. Down in Orlando, a guy came up and I was in the Air Force for 20 years. I said, well, you probably don't have any UFO stories, do you? He says, well, I have just one. I said, well, was it? And he says, well, I was in Vietnam. There was a lot of that activity in Vietnam, wasn't there? He says, well, it's apparently. And he was in the weather tower, and there's a guy in the control tower. And that's the most boring duty. He sits there and looks at the weather. Well, the weather is muggy. <laughs> and the control tower is, you know, a control tower. So they're sitting there, and it's late, and they're just doing nothing. And a uh, guy calls from the control tower. He says, uh, you got anything on your radar? He says, why do you ask that? He says, well, I've got something that looks like it's coming in contrary to where you're supposed to come in. It's coming in the opposite direction of the way we approach the runway. And it's coming in fast. So he goes and looks at his radar, and he says, yeah, it's coming in the wrong way, and it's coming in fast. And he says, I'm going to go, you watch the radar. I'm going outside. And he goes outside, and he looks up, and, and then it stops. <laughs> and it stays motionless for a few minutes, and then goes away. Those are the kind of stories people come up and share. But what's relevant is that he said, we, I, they were both supposed to report it. And the guy said to him, are you going to report it? No, you, t you called me. You've got to report it. Well, I'm not going to report it. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times people have told me uh, a story like that. I'm not going to jeopardize my career. A commercial pilot told me, he says, well, we share the stories with each other. But when you've had a superior officer or a president of the company say, he must have been drinking and your career is on the line. You learn, you shut up. As my friend at NSA who does deception tells me, illusion, misdirection, and ridicule. But the greatest of these is ridicule. Because then you can hide something in plain sight. If you say that that table is there, and I say, you're not getting your room tonight. You're going to stand in the corner with your nose on the wall and you think I'm kidding, and then you go to the corner, and everybody else watches. We only have to put one guy in the corner with his nose on the wall, and pretty soon, tomorrow morning, I say there's no table, and everybody says, no table, no table. 
and pretty soon we all are in agreement. All I'm suggesting is that I've heard stories like that as a priest for 25 years, and my friend at NSA also wanted to know, passion to know, part of creativity, and he used his position when people came to the fort from all over the world, military and intelligence people, to have that same kind of confidential conversation inside and say, hey, you're at Minot, or you're at Pease Air Force Base, or you're at White Sands. What about that report? What was that? And he got the same thing. So what he concluded, he's in his 70s now, and he said, the only thing I can conclude is that there is an intrusion into our civilization over time from something somewhere else. All right, so anyway, uh, creativity is about thinking the unthinkable. Uh, the first time I heard it, I thought there were great stories. They're numinous stories. They, you know, mandalas. When Bob said that to me, it shifted the context, and now something became thinkable. It became thinkable. The task of the creative person is how you continue to think things that are unthinkable to other people while keeping them thinkable to you. For me, that's the toughest task. I do talk to people all over the place, and you hear all kinds of bits and pieces, and obviously I'm the kind who puts things together. And then you have a domain of knowledge in which you find you don't, you don't share the space that the other people around you seem to share because you're speaking from presuppositions and point of view that knows things that they don't know. So one of the tasks of creativity and humanity is to, how do you know what you know? Continue to get what you need to get, and yet not alienate the people around you because they think you're an arrogant prick. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's very, very challenging. But we simply have to accept eccentricity as part of our, our destiny. Um, I have a lot more, but I, th I think that's probably enough. I mean, I'll be around. Um, all right, you guys stayed. So two free books. All right, as soon as the rest of you have bought these other 10 books, I'm going to give away. <laughs> All right, if somebody wants to buy one, I'll sign it. It's 20 bucks. See me after the talk. Um, what these are are the columns. I referred to about 150 of them. Singers brought them out. They were collected. They're the kinds of insights I've been sharing. You know how I go from one thing to another? Well, that's what this is, kind of go from one thing to another. Uh, and they're collected over eight years, and their insights into the way transforming technologies have altered identity, intelligence, geopolitical structures, psychology, spirituality, goddamn everything. <laughs> okay, who wants one? You better buy it. You asked all those questions, so you get one. Now, you walked forward and made yourself very prominent, so you don't get one. You're, you're a girl, and we're weak for girls. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, anybody want to ask any other questions for you? This is around 9.30. Yeah. Yes. Because... Uh, it's genuinely anomalous in terms of what our technologies are capable of doing. In other words, the question I asked this guy, because I'm always looking for the, you know, the other angle. You're skeptical, right? You're agnostic. And the, one of the answers that you get is, yeah, your friend may have thought that. They may have seen something, silvery disk, 15 feet across, came up 30 feet across, came out of nowhere, circled the plane, paced them for a while, and took off at a speed they couldn't match. Maybe he wasn't cleared. Uh, we have all kinds of black projects. Ed Hill in 78 when I was there. You'd see this stuff fly in. He's, you know, and I asked Bob and other people, what was that? And they said, what was what? <laughs> you know, don't, yeah, tell me you can't keep a secret. Um, it was stealth. And, and we didn't know what it was. We just knew we'd seen something weird. The question is, if we had that kind of technology that has the aerodynamic capabilities that have now been observed for more than 50 years all over the world, According to reports that agree on the small details, including on radar, photographed, and, you know, Edgar Mitchell. Do you know Edgar Mitchell? Do you know that name? It was me growing up, I guess. Fort Apollo 14, walked on the moon, had a life-changing experience coming back from the moon, saw the unity of all things, suddenly saw that everything was connected. He has spent the rest of his life trying to communicate his vision using the language of quantum physics to people who think that things are separate and there are boundaries around things and non-local consciousness is just something we made up. 
Well, Edgar Mitchell has access to people, and he told me he went to the intelligence people who report to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And he said, I don't want the details. I just want to know, is there a program to manage how we are handling the reality of the phenomena? And the guy went away, he came back, he said, next week, and he said, this is all I'm going to tell you, yes. But that's all you're going to get. Now, don't bring it up again. We're handling it. Now, now, the question is, did we have that kind of technology? Could we do those kinds of things that were demonstrated by these vehicles, and yet we had hundreds of pilots shot down, tortured, and killed in Vietnam at the same time 40 years ago? Well, we will, we will lose lives. We will sacrifice people to secrets that must be kept, but not on that scale. And we don't have anything like that today. And what that guy told me just a couple days ago, I, I'm just saying I hear it again and again. All I can tell you is what people tell me. He said, I've talked to lots of people in the Air Force. We've shared lots of stories like that. And I ask, were any of them, you know, because some of them, <clears throat> tell you a couple, you won't go to sleep. So I don't want to do that. But these are just moving lights, right? That doesn't scare anybody. Nothing has come out of it. You know, <laughs> right. <laughs> like you never stop your car and get out at the gas station. Um, Maybe they just use our lakes you know, to replenish their pure water. They need the heavy hydrogen. There's a lot of activity around lakes. I've got stories from Wisconsin that would will your ears from people who are walking out in the woods one night. You know, and it's just, this is over 25 years, so I'm being light with it now. But the, uh, it's the accumulation in, of reports over 50 years that agree in the small details. That what's funny here in our culture is not kind of funny everywhere, so 40s, 50s, 60s maybe, but 50 years all over the world. Um, and, it, and it lasted for 50 years, and it continues to last, and they agree in the small details. This is suggestive that we have a genuine phenomena. And I always leave it at that. I don't know what it is. I don't want to leap to provide the content. But he, because it is intelligently piloted craft, you know, my friend, a friend at NASA has documented 3,500 commercial pilot reports and fighter pilot reports. 3,500 reports. And those are the ones that weren't afraid to talk about. Right. That's right. Um, so it's, it's suggestive. It's what it suggests. As, as a logical, uh, or as um, the guy who did the Project Blue Book thing said before they re re retracted his book and made him rewrite the ending, he said the least unlikely hypothesis is the extraterrestrial hypothesis. This was not 1956. So it's just a hypothesis. I mean, and we go to Mars, right? If you're a farmer on Mars, you look up, you see a great big beach ball fall out of the sky, bounces, right? Towels come off. You say, what the hell is that beach ball? Little R2-D2, primitive, slow, dumb, comes out, bumps up against the rock, drills. Hey, wait a minute. It's my rock. They love rocks. Drills the rock, doesn't care what the farmer says. You watch it. Goes down into the crater. Six months later, comes up out of the crater. <laughs> right? Goes and tells his neighbor, he says, you see, God damn this thing. That back 40 of mine that I was probably, you know, it's a beach ball come out of the sky, a little R2-D2 came out, went down the crater, stayed, there, stayed in the crater six months. Why would anybody stay in the crater six months? Maybe he's slow. Oh, yeah, slow. <laughs> he could come out of the sky in a beach ball, but it took him six months to get through the crater. I, I mean, think about it. Is there evidence for UFOs on Mars? Obviously, extraterrestrial planetary vehicles that do things no Martian can do have landed and begun a scientific experiment, surveillance, reconnaissance, and exploration with the intention of colonizing the planet for us. You don't find that preposterous. But in 1956, the Royal Astronomer in England said space travel is, quote, utter bilge. 57, Sputnik went up. What I'm saying is the thinkable, you know, let me just tell you, I mean, just put this in your pipe and smoke it sometime. Robert Galvin, head of Motorola, it's just great, 40 years, breakthrough ideas, strange ideas meetings, in order to let people brainstorm all the weirdest shit they could. You thought about creativity. They asked him at the end of his career what ideas were breakthrough ideas, how you could recognize them. And he said, Thinking about it, he said, you know, every idea that turned out to be a breakthrough idea began its opinion as a minor, began its life as an opinion of one. Someone said it on the edges and nobody heard it. And if they said it again, everybody laughed. 
And if they said it again, they laugh with derision. And if they said it again, they tried to attack the person, destroy them, uh, ruin their reputation. And then finally it arrived where it always arrives. Not only does everybody believe it, but they've always believed it all along. And we call it consensus reality. By the time it's the center of a new consensus, new truth is arriving at the edge. The truth is always at the edge. You know, so the point is, uh, George Bernard Shaw said all great truth begins as blasphemy. It is an assertion contrary to orthodoxy in what the common people believe is obviously true, self-evident and commonsensical. Now, it doesn't mean every crazy idea is a breakthrough idea. It does mean that every breakthrough idea sounds crazy because it doesn't fit the way normal people, not you guys, those guys out there in the swimming pool, the way normal people think about the world. Well, they're out there doing that. Splash, 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 splash. We're in here thinking deep thoughts, right? This is not normal 10 o'clock on a Friday night, <laughs> right? You know that, right? You should be seeing Twitch or Fletch or whatever the goddamn movie at the multiplex is this week. You know, that mind-numbing stuff. So that's all I can say is, is that the, hypothesis, the evidence seems to suggest that hypothesis. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that there are or are not aliens. Assuming that there are aliens and they're somehow, your friend is somehow intelligent. Uh-huh. That is a strange use of, that's a strange way to put it, intriguing. It does sort of well, change the word. I mean, you can say it any way you want. He's not God. He was just saying his, his conclusion is that what we're seeing is evidence of a tangency to our civilization from another civilization. Okay, but was there, is there evidence of what you're saying? Are there parts of the story that you're not saying that would, also, that would, that would justify the word usage? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I want you to sleep tonight. <laughs> I mean, it's a hacker con. We don't want people running through the hallways screaming. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, they, they, we, we can play with this. I don't mean to distract it, but that's what happens when you get into this stuff. See, what's really called forth is anxiety, animating the cognitive function, saying, what the hell? What the hell? I mean, what, what he's doing is exactly what we're all doing. It's an example of our mind made visible. You're trying to figure out what is the language to use to describe that which is impossible to describe in the prior terms that we've been using. You know, and it's, and it's been validated by history over and over. 200 years ago, you go to England, City of London, Bank of England, and say, where's the center? They say, right here. Because British Empire, sun never set. Our power was just in ascendancy. And the Bank of London is the engine that makes the economy of the British Empire sing. But anyone who had eyes to see would see the American century. All out of the edges, nobody could see that the colonies, it was unthinkable that the colonies would be the new center. 200 years later, the American century came, and it looks like it probably went. You know? So when you ask people, where are the, where's the center now? You know, remember that picture of the Earth from the moon? Everybody said, oh my god, we can see the Earth whole. The Earth, is, except it's already obsolete. By the time you get an image of the Earth whole, it's already moving to something else. The center is not here. The center is there. In my lifetime, there is where. We need a better word, right? Better word than space. Creativity, creative people invent the language to describe emergent realities. Nietzsche said original thinking is seeing about 10 seconds faster than everybody else what's coming up over the horizon and giving it a name. Naming these realities, what you just exemplified, is exactly the task that confronts us, which is how to puzzle through what to say about these things that don't make sense. And it's not a trivial task. Do you know? Uh, Astronauts. I mentioned uh, Edgar Mitchell, right? Astronaut. Okay, do you know that we used to have aeronauts? You know what aeronauts did? They, f they were people who got on a plane and let it take them somewhere. In the 1920s, the only way we had some planes flying around America after World War I were the United States government subsidized taking mail in those planes from one place to another. And people would sometimes get on the plane and ride with the mail, and they were called very daring, adventuresome types, aeronauts. And the government wanted to lower the subsidies and start to make the planes get more money from other sources. And so it said, we need a better term than aeronaut. We need something that people could see themselves being. So they had a little contest. Do you know what word they came up with? Passenger. That's right. Passenger. Now, to you, it sounds, well, everybody knows what a passenger is. But two seconds before one, 
Nobody knew it. Everybody knows what an astronaut is. It's a special person with great capabilities, one in a billion. You know? But we need, well, Buzz Aldrin came in Milwaukee, we need space tourists. We need space hotels. We need, we need to change the interface so you and I can see ourselves going up there without a 10 or $20 million to pay the Russians to get a suborbital flight, <laughs> some damn thing. You know? And soon we will have, we need other names. Well, just look out. Look back 100 years, then look out and amplify it by genetic engineering and re-engineering our subjective space and our physical capabilities and our intelligence and combine that with the interplanetary world that's coming and the, with the transforming power of technologies that are converging not only in appliances and networks but in us. You know that. Not only wearable but chips in our heads. That was one of the ideas that came out of a strange ideas meeting 10 years ago at Motorola. A chip in the head. When I suggested to people, people laughed because it sounded crazy. And now we've got implants, right? And the guy's learning to move the cursor. And pretty soon it'll be like, you mean a chip in your heart? A pacemaker? Everybody knows what a pacemaker is because it has come to the center and we assimilate it and then it becomes water to fish. So we need people, like he was trying to do, to articulate the new emergent realities, integrate them, and we can't do it alone. And all I'm saying is keep the creative, keep the creative ferment going and do not stop the conversation too soon. Because the truths that are emerging are genuinely more astonishing than what we can literally think. But because of the nature of the work you have tasked yourself to do, you're in a good position to begin thinking about it anyway. Okay? Nighty night. <laughs> if you want to buy a book, and if you want to try to get it down to a cheaper price, you can try that. <laughs> Very effective. <laughs> uh, anything else? I mean, I keep saying that's the end, but you're still sitting there. <laughs> Is that it? Okay. Thank you.